Okay, so welcome back, everybody. This is the end of week 15 of class, and we're going to finish up our lecture on Faraday's Law today. All right? So where we left off was we were dealing with this problem of basically a metal bar uh, which creates a circuit uh, using these two rails, and this entire apparatus is in a magnetic field. So we imagine pushing the bar to the left or to the right. In doing so, we're changing the magnetic flux through this, uh, through this loop here, and we're inducing some current to start flowing in that loop. Okay, so that was the sort of basic problem we were looking at last time. So in this particular case, we have a magnetic field coming out of the page, and we have this bar being pushed to the left. My question for you is, which way will the induced current flow? Are you going to have clockwise current going like this, or are you going to have counterclockwise current going like that? And then the follow-up is this. What is the direction of the magnetic force, that is the force that this bar is going to experience due to the B field? Okay? It's either going to be to the left or to the right. So, give it a shot. Take a minute or two. Should be doing some right-hand rule stuff to figure this one out, uh, and then we'll go through it together. So, see what you come up with. We'll put it to a vote. So we have our answers for the first question. Okay, let's put it to a vote. Who says that the induced current is going to go clockwise? Hands for clockwise. Okay, a couple. Hands for counterclockwise. Okay, if you said counterclockwise, you're right. Let's go through the logic of this, okay? I'm just going to say it in words, not going to write anything down. Remember, Lenz's law is what's going to answer this question for us. Lenz's law states that the induced current here is going to oppose the change in flux that's occurring. So we have to look at the situation and realize that A, the flux through this loop here, where the current is flowing, is decreasing. We agree? We have less magnetic field lines going through the loop over time because we're decreasing the area effectively. Okay? When we have a decrease in flux, your induced B field that is the B field that occurs because of this current that starts flowing. That's going to have to go with your external field, which is the one we see right here pointing out of the page. Okay, so in other words, so current is, start, is going to start flowing in such a way that we get a B field induced coming out of the page. So the only question now is, how do we get a B field coming out of the page with current clockwise or counterclockwise? Well, try each one. Use the right hand rule, okay? So your thumb goes in the direction, let's say it's going clockwise, just as a, a way of checking. If it's going clockwise, then let's say the segment of wire down here has a current going in this direction. My thumb's going that way, but see my fingers are curling into the pitch. That's the wrong direction. If I go counterclockwise like this, now my fingers curl out of the pitch. Okay, so that's why we know it's counterclockwise. Now, what about the second question? So the magnetic field here is going to exert a force on the bar as it's being pushed. What direction is that force? Left or right? Who says the force is to the left? Who says the force is to the right? Okay, so you're, you're correct. Now, we, we've seen an example before that's kind of like this where uh, I'm pushing the bar the other way to increase the area, and we saw that basically the magnetic force is opposing my push. That's still the case here, um, but let's just do the right-hand rule to uh, kind of see that it works out that way. So as we said, there's counterclockwise current flowing in this direction, right? So at the location of this bar, my current is going which way? It's going up, correct? Okay. 
So how do I figure out a magnetic force? Uh, it's IL cross B, okay? So in other words, I take my right hand, I point my fingers in the direction of I, which the current going through the bar is straight up, okay? And then I curl my fingers in the direction of the B field, which is out of the page. The force is going to the right, okay? So it's basically opposing the push, right? If I'm trying to push the bar this way, the magnetic field is going to create a force that opposes that push. All right, so that's the idea behind that one. Any questions? All right. So that example that we've been working with between the end of the last uh, day of lecture on Monday and today is an example of something a little more general called motional EMF. Okay, so in the example that we've seen, we imagine this metal bar sliding along some rails. Okay, now it doesn't have to be that exact scenario in order for an EMF to be induced. In fact, a motional EMF is going to be induced in any object that is moving perpendicular to a magnetic field. Okay, so in other words, we can just have the bar moving along like this without creating a complete circuit, and you'll still have that motional EMF. So here's how we can understand this in a different way. I, I showed you why this EMF BLV comes out uh, using Faraday's law. We did that in the last lecture. Okay, so if you're not recognizing this equation, we worked it out last time. But there's another way to show it not using Faraday's law. So what I want you to picture is this. We have a metal bar, let's say, and it's inside of a B field. The B field lines are coming out at us like this. Okay? And we're going to move this metal bar to the right. Okay? So it's just going to be flying through the B field with some velocity going to the right. So the way I want us to think about this is let's think about individual electrons in this metal bar and what kind of force they might experience as a result of this motion. Okay? Remember, an electron is just a charged particle. There are going to be plenty of free electrons that can move around inside this metal bar. And each one is going to feel the force given by QV cross B. Are you agree? All right, so just pick some random electron in the bar and we'll do QV cross B to try to figure out what kind of force it experiences. Okay? Well, we're doing V cross B where V is going that way and B is coming out of the page. Let's start with that. I take my right hand, I'm going to point my fingers in the direction of V, and then if I'm going to curl them out of the page in the direction of B, it looks like this, okay? And my thumb, which is giving you the direction of the force, is going down. However, if we're talking about electrons here, those are negative charges, so what do I have to do as a final step? Flip, them. Flip it around. So electrons, in fact, are going to feel the force going up in this scenario. Okay? So electrons are going to be pushed upwards. That means towards the top of the bar, I'm going to have an excess of electrons, right? And then because electrons are going to leave the bottom of the bar, I'm going to have like a deficit of electrons there. In other words, I'm going to have a net negative charge on the top and a net positive charge on the bottom, just because the electrons are going to be feeling a force that pushes them to the top of the bar. Okay? Go ahead. So protons don't flip, right? That's what you mean. Yeah, because the, the protons, remember, are just stuck inside of atoms. So if we're imagining this is like a metal bar, it's really the electrons that would be free to move. But the net effect is what's important, is that you get an opposite charge on each side. And as we know, if you have opposite charges on each side, you have a potential difference. You have a voltage across the rock. Okay? But to say, uh, this motional EMF is sort of a more general phenomenon that we can understand even with like older material that we've seen before. So let's do a quick example. Let's find the voltage induced across a 10 centimeter long screwdriver that's moving through Earth's magnetic field, which is 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. That's the strength right there. Let's say the speed is 2 meters per second. Okay. So this is pretty typical of just like holding a screwdriver and like you know, walking fast across the room basically, right? Now do we expect that this is going to be 
a large voltage, like 10,000 volts? Probably not. It's probably going to be something kind of negligible. So let's do the calculation. All right. So this motional EMF that occurs when you have an object just moving through a B field, where there's a potential difference across it as a result, is given by BLV. Where in this case, we have B is 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. We have the length of our screwdriver as 10 centimeters. So 10 times 10 to the minus 2 meters, that's L. And then we're imagining that we're moving it at 2 meters per second. And that's B. All right, so what does this work out to? Somebody tell me. Ten to the minus five volts. Okay, so nothing too substantial there. Because you have a pretty weak field and you're moving pretty slowly through it, right? Okay. So, any questions on that before we move on to the next type of example? Okay. So, when it comes to Faraday's law, remember at the very beginning I told you that if there's a changing magnetic flux you induce an EMF. And there's basically three ways you can change the magnetic flux through some kind of surface. You can change just how strong the B field is. We saw some examples of that. You can change the area. We saw a few examples of that also. The last thing you can do is change the angle. Okay, so that's what we're gonna focus on now. In other words, you can rotate your coil through a B field changing the angle as time goes on, and that's going to induce an EMF. And as we're going to find out, this is how a generator works. This is how an AC generator works. Pretty much all of our electrical power in our grid is generated in this way. Okay, so this is really important. So here's the scenario. We have a coil of wire in a uniform magnetic field. And let's just say it's pointing to the right along the x-axis. We're going to have the coil itself be rotating. Let's say it's rotating about the z-axis like this. And let's just have it rotate at a constant rate. So 60 revolutions per minute would be an example of just like a constant rate rather than accelerating over time, okay? Um, what we're gonna do is find an expression for the EMF induced in this coil as a function of time. So first of all, I hope you can basically see that yes, we're gonna be inducing an EMF because you imagine the B field's going this way. When my coil is oriented vertically, I'm gonna have the most flux going through it. And then when it's oriented like this, I'm gonna have zero flux going through it. And then there's everything in between. So the flux is constantly gonna be changing. So you do expect, again, there's some kind of EMF being induced. So let's work out exactly what that is. Okay, so start with the picture. I'm going to show the coil itself uh, edge on. So we're just seeing it from the side like this. That is our coil. And our B field, that's going straight to the right like this. All right. Now, what we have is magnetic flux that we want to calculate through this coil. And remember, we call this uh, psi B. Now, in this case, um, you know, usually we would say the general expression is integral of B dot dA over the entire surface of the coil. But the thing is, I have a uniform B field here. So it's the same B field at the bottom of the coil as at the top. And my surface itself is flat. So I actually don't need to do this integral. Does anyone remember the more simplified way of writing this? B dot A. Yeah, it's just B, which is a constant, dot A. That's all we need to do. Okay. So this dot product is B times the area of our coil 
times cosine of the angle between the area vector and the B field. So actually on this picture, we should probably show the area vector. How does the area vector work? What direction is it oriented at relative to our surface? Perpendicular, perpendicular to it, right? So perpendicular to our surface would be an area vector coming out like this. There's the right angle to the surface. Okay? Is that pointing in the z direction? It's not pointing in any particular direction, it's just pointing perpendicular to the coil. Because again, this thing's rotating, so we want to be general. But this is the angle theta between A and B. Does that picture make sense, everybody? So B is not changing, the strength of the B field is just constant. A is not changing, the coil just has a fixed area, but again, it's theta that's changing in this case. So now what we should do is a little bit of side work. Because, you know, theta is not just some number. It's going to be some function of time, given that we're rotating like this. Okay? So I'm going to bring back some material from physics 45. Do you guys remember angular kinematics? This describes how the angle of a rotating object might be changing over time. That's probably what we want over here, right? So I'm going to remind you of something. There's an equation that says theta equals theta naught plus omega naught times time plus one half alpha t squared. Okay, so what is theta? That's the angle the angular position of your rotating object. Does anyone remember what omega means in this equation? Velocity. That's angular velocity. It's how fast it's spinning, right? Does anyone remember what alpha means? Angular acceleration. Angular acceleration. Okay. In this case, I'm going to cancel out. I'm just going to cross off the angular acceleration term because we're thinking about a situation where we're just spinning at a constant speed rather than speeding up or slowing down, okay? So, because we have a constant speed of rotation, that term can go away. Also, theta naught, that's just the angle that we start at, and it doesn't matter what you call the starting angle, let's just call it zero for simplicity, okay? So, that starting angle is kind of arbitrary. Let's just set it to zero. Okay. So that means theta is simply omega times time. If you're rotating at a constant rate, the angle you rotate through is your angular speed times time. So hopefully that makes some sense, right? So check this out. That means our flux is given by B times A times cosine omega t. That's how my flux is changing over time. It's described by this formula right here. Is that good? Okay, so next we have an expression for the magnetic flux through the coil. We can now use Faraday's law to say what the EMF induced in this coil should be. Okay, in other words, we're going to produce some sort of voltage. Um, and we say uh, the EMF has an absolute value given by N times what? You guys remember? Uh, the derivative of flux over time, right? Yeah, the derivative of this flux with respect to time. So we're just going to work out that derivative and we'll have our answer. So N is the number of turns. And then we have d by dt of b a, and then we have cosine omega t. All right, so, so first of all, remember b and a in this situation are both constants, okay? Those are not changing in any way. So what do I have out front? N, n b a, okay? n b a. <laughs> Um, and then when I take the derivative of cosine, what do I get? Negative sine. Yeah, I get negative sine, and what else? 
this omega comes out, right? There's, a, there's an omega factor. So the derivative of cosine omega t is minus omega sine omega t, okay? So why don't we just write it this way? Again, I'm, I'm just interested in the absolute value here, so just forget about the negative sign. Um, let's pull out this omega to the front, say, WNBA, how about that, okay? And then sine omega t, okay, there we go. So the voltage is some kind of constant in the front, but then it varies sinusoidally, okay? So we can think of this constant in the front as being the maximum that we reach, okay? That's the maximum voltage. And omega, remember, that was the frequency of the rotation, right? So that same exact frequency that we're rotating at is the frequency that our voltage is going up and down, okay? So if we plot our voltage over time, it looks like a sine wave where it reaches this peak and it oscillates with frequency omega. So the faster you rotate the coil, the faster the voltage is gonna bounce up and down basically. Okay? So we good on that? Make sense? All right, so here's the result then, okay? The EMF you induce in this coil as a function of time is some maximum value times sine omega t, where this maximum value is the number of turns in our coil, which is 10, times A, which is the area of the coil, times B, which is the strength of the magnetic field that this thing is in, and then omega, which is the frequency of the rotation. So just want to be careful about one thing here. Omega is measured in radians per second. Okay, so instead of revolutions per second or something else, the unit of angle we use is radians for all of this math to work out. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Omega implies radians. But other than that, uh, that's the expression that's pretty straightforward. So, any questions so far? Okay. Let's get a, a bit more of a visual picture on this. Okay, so in a generator, you've got this B field going through the coil. What could create such a B field? Well, you could just have strong magnets on either side, right, to create a, a B field going across. And then we do something to rotate the coil, okay? So once we get that coil rotating at speed omega, it's gonna look like this. So as the coil rotates, the EMF induced in the coil, again, is going up and down. It's a sinusoidal function where we have some maximum voltage that we reach in the positive direction, but we also hit it in the negative direction going down. And um, for each rotation that the coil makes, my voltage goes up and down an entire cycle. So, this is the natural way, this is a really easy way to produce alternating current, right? Because with AC power, this is what's going on. Your current is fluctuating up and down sinusoidally at some type of frequency. You can control the frequency by just controlling the speed of the rotation of the coil, okay? So this is how an AC generator works. And again, I wanna stress, pretty much all of the power in our electrical grid with the exception of solar, is produced in this way at some level, using a, a generator, using rotational motion, converting that into an alternating current. So hopefully you guys see how that works now. Okay, questions? All right, try this one out. We have an AC generator, which consists of a circular coil of wire, which has a diameter of 16 centimeters, and we put it inside of a uniform magnetic field, which has a magnitude of 0.15 Tesla. You want to generate a sinusoidal voltage in the coil with a frequency of 60 Hertz and a maximum of 175 volts. So 
You want 60 hertz to be how quickly the voltage oscillates up and down, so 60 cycles per second. And you want it to peak at 175 volts each cycle. Okay? My question for you is how many turns of wire should this coil have? How many times do you need to wrap it around for this to work? My other question is, let's say we connect this generator to some kind of load which has a resistance of 45 ohms. What will the maximum current be uh, provided by that generator? So try to work this out and then we'll discuss it. So take uh, three, four minutes to work on this. All right, let's, um, let's go through this one. So what I'm trying to get you to use here is that when it comes to an AC generator, the maximum EMF induced is given by NAB times omega. We're trying to find N. We know that the max EMF we want is 175 volts. We know that much. We also know that V, the V field that we're going to have access to is 0.15 Tesla, okay? As for the area, we're not given that directly, but it's a simple calculation. Uh, it's a circular coil, so the area of it is gonna be pi r squared. The diameter is 16 centimeters, so the radius is half that, right? So for the radius, we have pi times a half, of 16, and let's convert that to meters by multiplying by 10 to the minus two. So a half times 16 times 10 to the minus two meters is the radius. And if we square it, we get the area. This is what the area comes out to. It's 0 
zero one one square meters. That's the area of our coil. Okay, as for omega, that's basically the speed that our coil needs to rotate at, but it's also the um, it's also the frequency of the AC voltage that's induced. And it's at 60 hertz. So 60 hertz, um, hertz is the same as cycles per second, okay? Remember that. And we don't want it in cycles per second, we want it in radians per second, so what's the conversion? Two pi, every one cycle consists of two pi radians, correct? So just multiply through by 2 pi. What does that give you? 2 pi times 60. Someone tell me. 125. Nope, not quite. 2 pi times 60. 376.99. 376.99. Yeah. Radians per second. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to solve for n. This is telling me if I want to design this generator to do exactly what I want, I need to create a coil with a certain number of wrappings of wire for it to work. So that's going to be, if we go by the original equation, the max EMF over AB omega. So let's plug the numbers in. What's our max EMF? 175 volts. What's our area? 0 0.02011 square meters. What's our B field? 0.15 Tesla. And what's our omega? 376.99 radians per second, okay? Let's not go through the units. Let's just use our result that, you know, Everything's in SI. This should come out in the units we expect, and it's N. So, what units do we expect on that? Hertz. Just, just well, unitless basically, right? No units. Uh, what does that come out to? Someone uh, want to tell me? 155. I'm getting 154. 154. All right. So, if we want to design our coil, it's got to have 154 terms of wire. All right, as for the other question, what is the maximum current if we hook the generator up to a load, which is 45 ohms in resistance? For that, we just use Ohm's law. The EMF is I times R, okay, that's simple. So the current, if we want the maximum value, should be the maximum value of our EMF divided by R. And that's 175 volts divided by 45 ohms. So what's that current? 3.89. Right, so in our device that we're powering, we're going to have an alternating current, but the peak of that current is going to be 3.89 amps. Okay? What was the first question? How many, how many turns? That's oh, N. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. <clears throat> so let's keep moving and let me ask you this kind of conceptual question. So we, we basically just went over the operating principle behind an electrical generator. What it is is you have a coil rotating in a magnetic field and as a result of that, you get this alternating current flowing through the coil. That means we're producing some electrical energy, right? Where is that energy coming from? What do we think? Would it be from the back and forth of the uh, electrons? Friction? All these things would be not adding to the energy we're putting in. Here, it's, it's kind of like the, the problem of pushing the bar, right? It's not just going to move on its own. You have, to, you have to do some work 
to move the bar in that example we did last time. In the same exact way, you need to perform work in order to rotate the coil, okay? The coil is not just gonna rotate on its own. And you can show, although we're not gonna go through this exercise, we did go through the exercise when it came to pushing the bar, but you can show that the more electrical energy you generate, the more work you're gonna to have to do in order to rotate the coil. Has anyone used like a hand cranked generator before where you just turn a light bulb on? If you've ever done this, you'll know that the brighter you want the bulb to be, the harder you have to work to turn the coil. So the more energy you want to get out of your generator, the more energy you have to put in, in the form of mechanical work, okay? And by the way, most generators obviously are not going to be cranked by hand. Uh, we're going to use other methods to turn the coil. Uh, can anyone think of, let's say, in our power grid, what types of things do we use to turn the coil to create the rotational motion in the first place? Hydroelectric. Hydroelectric, great example, right? Use falling water to turn your turbine and uh, rotate your coil and produce the AC current. Any other examples you can think of? Wind. Wind, yeah, wind farms doing just this, right? What else? Yeah, combustion of fossil fuels. You can heat up some water using burning fossil fuels, create rising steam. That rising steam spins a turbine, and then you have the effect we just talked about. You create AC power, okay? So you need some input of mechanical work. It can come from various different places, but uh, this energy is not coming for free, right? Uh, you need to put in some energy to get some energy out, okay? So the, the lesson I just want you to take away, again, is that this uh, effect of electromagnetic induction, it's not magical. It doesn't violate the laws of physics as we know them. The energy you get out is coming from somewhere. Right, because energy is conserved overall, right? So if we're producing some electrical energy in this process, it has to be coming from somewhere else. So in the, the two examples where I think you can see this most clearly, again, is this example we did, where you have a circuit created by putting a bar across these rails and having this all inside of a magnetic field. If we want to push the bar this way, um, we generate some current going in this direction, but that creates a magnetic force which is opposing our push. So basically, the more current we want to generate, the faster we have to push the bar, but the more we'll feel an opposing magnetic force, okay? So we'll have to, in other words, do more and more work to get more and more electrical energy out in that process. And the same holds true for the generator, right? The type of work you do is exerting a torque rather than exerting a force. You have to exert a torque to get this thing spinning. But basically you'll find that if you exert a torque in one direction to get it spinning the way you want, the magnetic field itself is going to exert a torque going the other way. Remember we talked about how in situations like this where you have a loop with some current running through it, the magnetic field itself exerts a torque. And that's always opposing the torque that you input, okay? So the point is, the more electrical energy you generate in this coil, the more of an opposing torque you're gonna feel, and the more energy you're gonna have to put in just to move it in the first place, okay? So um, the energy is not for free, it's always coming from somewhere else. That's the lesson. Okay, questions on that? Okay, so, to summarize, we've gone through Faraday's law in basically every scenario you can imagine with a changing B field, a changing area, and a changing angle. But I'm going to show you one example where more than one thing is changing at the same time. In other words, what if it's not just that we change the strength of the B field, but let's change the strength of the B field and at the same time change the area. I just want to show you how that works uh, mathematically. Okay, so here's what's going on in this problem. We've got a metal bar, length L equals 38 centimeters. 
and the resistance of that bar, 1 ohm. Um, it lies across these two rails, which are connected by this wire right here. All right, so there's a B field that this whole apparatus is inside of. Let's say initially the strength of that B field is one Tesla. Let's also say that the bar is initially 10 meters away from this edge. See, X is how far the bar is from the edge of our apparatus. So let's say it starts off at 10 meters. All right, so then at T equals zero, we begin to push the bar to the left. Okay, so we're going to push it that way at a constant speed of 2.45 meters per second. So think about it. When we push the bar to the left, we're changing the area, right? So we know how to handle that one. We've seen examples before. But let's say at the same time, the B field strength begins to increase at a rate of 0.1 Tesla per second. So what we're doing here is we're decreasing the area by pushing the bar this way, but we're increasing the strength of the B field. We're turning that <coughs> as time goes on. So the question is, what is the induced current at T equals three seconds? So three seconds after I begin to push the bar this way, how much current are we inducing in the coil? We're going to compute that. And then we're going to answer a tricky question, which is, is that current going to be clockwise or counterclockwise? Okay, so we all clear on what's going on here? Let's go through it. So I'm gonna copy down that picture. That picture, we're gonna put it on our page and add to it. So here is the apparatus. We've got these two rails and we've got the bar going across like this. Okay, the length of that rail, we'll call that L, going this way. And basically the position of the rail relative to the left side, that's X. All right, the B field, I'll just draw one B field line coming out of the page. We know it's uniformly coming out of the page, but that's just for reference. And we're pushing the bar to the left, so that means the velocity of it is going like this to the left. Cool? All right. So this is just going to be an application of Faraday's law to figure out how much current we have. Um, basically, we're going to write down a formula for the flux through that loop, and then we're going to take the derivative of it to see what the induced EMF is. Okay, so write down what the flux is, then write down what the derivative is, all right? So for the flux, do we have to do the integral or no? Uh, no, right, it's uniform? Yeah, it's a uniform B field going through a perfectly flat surface. So I can write this as simply B dot A, okay? And, well, how does my area vector point in this situation? got to be perpendicular to the page, right? So it goes just how the B field goes. So when I take the dot product, it's just BA cosine of zero, okay? So my area vector also perpendicular to the page. Okay, um, let's do a little bit more on that. Um, we know that there's gonna be some kind of EMF induced, right? <clears throat> in this loop, let's say. And that's going to be given by Faraday's law. So I'm going to write down what we know about Faraday's law, the EMF-induced epsilon. We're just going to find the absolute value of it here. Is equal to the number of turns times the absolute value of the phi dt. Okay, how many, uh, what should I put in for N here? That's just one, yeah. Uh, and I should actually write down one then, yeah? Okay, so one, um, and then we have the derivative with respect to time 
of the flux, which is just B times A. For now, I'm just going to write it as B times A. But let me ask you this. You know, usually at this step, we, we try to think about what things I could potentially pull out of the, inner, of the derivative, right? Can I pull B or A out in this case? No, because B is changing, and so is A. They're both changing. So how do I handle this derivative? Um, product rule? Yeah, it's a product rule. Okay? If B and A are both changing, then I have to apply the product rule to get the derivative of the product of B and A, right? How does that work? You guys remember product rule? It's, uh, it's F prime of X times G of X. Okay, so it's, let's write it this way. Let's take the derivative of B with respect to time, and then multiply that just by A. And then add to that B left alone times the derivative with respect to time of A. That's the product rule. That's what we just did. Okay? So it looks like to get our answer, we not only need to figure out what the area and the strength of the B field is at the time in question, which is t equals 3 seconds, but we also need the derivative of each one. Okay? Once we have both of A and B and the derivatives, then we can plug them in. That's, that's the game plan, okay? So, let's start doing the work for that. Um, first, I'll note that the position of the bar can be written in this way. What was that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, that's okay. Uh, so this, the position of the bar x, okay, is um, the initial position wherever we start, and then minus the speed of the bar times time. Let's let's think about that, right? Because the bar is moving to the left, x is going to be decreasing. So at t equals zero, we say it's at some position x zero, and then we just subtract off that distance that we move the bar, which is b times time. Okay, does that make sense? So that's a formula that tells us the position of the bar. For the area of the loop, what do we have? We have a equals l times x, correct? We have l times x. But for x, that's what's changing, right? According to this uh, formula that we wrote down, which means I can write the area as L times X0, the starting position, minus the speed we're pushing the bar times the time. Okay, so that's a formula for the area. We want that because we'll need to take its derivative at some point, okay? Now, let's also write down uh, a formula for the strength of the field. Okay, and, and this is going to kind of work in the same way as the position of the bar, right? We know the B field starts off with some strength, which we call B naught. Okay, and then over time, we increase the strength of the field. Okay, um, so I'm just writing this symbolically, we'll put the numbers in, but basically, if my B field strength starts off at some value and then it ramps up in a linear fashion. We can write it as B naught plus RT. So it's our starting value plus some kind of rate of increase times time. Okay? So that's what we have. Let's do the calculations for T equals three seconds. Okay? So here's what we have at T equals three seconds. Okay? Let's start with uh, the area. So I can plug numbers right into this formula to figure out what the area will be at that time. So that's going to be the length of the bar. That was 38 centimeters or 0.38 meters. And then we have x naught 
That was our starting position, which is 10 meters. And then minus the speed, we're moving it, which was 2.45 meters per second. And then times the time, which is three seconds. Okay? So that's basically L times the X position of the bar to give us the area at this specific time, okay? And what do we end up getting for the area? Someone tell me. One point zero zero seven square meters is what that would be. Okay. We also, again, we don't just want the area, that's gonna be plugged in here, but we want the derivative of the area with respect to time, okay? So basically, if this is our formula for area, let's take the derivative of it. The derivative of L times X naught minus L V T. So symbolically, if I just have L times X naught, those are both constants, right? That's just the length of the bar and the starting position. So zero would be its derivative. What would be the derivative of this term, minus LVT? Would it just be LV? Yeah, minus LV is how that would go. And now let's put the numbers in. So it's going to be minus 0.38 meters, and then 2.45 meters per second. So just multiplying those two numbers gives us... Yeah, it's, and it's negative, 0 0.931 meters per second squared. Let's really think about that. This is the area, so you have like about a meter squared of area, but the rate at which the area is changing, that's what this is. So it's, uh, I'm sorry, then. it's meters squared per second, right? It's changing at a rate of minus 0 0.931 meters squared per second. So we're losing area at that rate. That's what that's telling you. Okay? Make sense? All right, now let's calculate B. What is the strength of the B field at the time in question? Well, it's our starting value, which is B naught. We start at one Tesla. That was given to us in the problem. And then the rate at which the field is increasing is 0.1 Tesla per second. So that's what I'm going to call R, is this number we were given, 0.1 Tesla per second. And if we multiply by 3 seconds, that's going to give us uh, the B-field strength at the time in question. So what does it equal? This is going to be 0.3, 1.3, right? 0.3 plus 1, 1.3 Tesla. That's how strong it will be. The derivative with respect to time of our B field strength is going to be the following. It's going to be, let's work it out, the derivative of this guy. The derivative with respect to time of B naught plus R times T. I just be R, right? Yeah, so exactly. It's a zero for the first term and then T goes to 1, and you just get R. So in other words, it's 0 0.100 Tesla per second. We already kind of knew that, right? The derivative of B with respect to time, that's how quickly it's changing. So that's the number we were given originally, 0 0.1 Tesla per second, okay? So let me just underline each one of those numbers. A, the derivative of A, B, and the derivative of B are all going into this calculation to give us the induced EMF, okay? That makes sense? So we worked out from the product rule that this is what we need to calculate. Now we have all the numbers that are going to actually go into that calculation. Okay, so here it is. The induced EMF has a magnitude of dB dt. Let's put that in first. Okay, that's this term. 0.1 Tesla per second. That's how quickly the field is changing. 
That gets multiplied by A. That's this number. 1.007 square meters. And then we add to that B. That's just the strength of the B field at T equals 3 seconds right there. That's this number. That's 1.3 Tesla. And then finally, we multiply that by dA dt. Got to be careful. That itself has a negative sign on it. We're not taking the absolute value of that. We're taking the absolute value of the whole result. So you got to keep that sign for now. Minus 0.931 meters squared per second. Right there. I'm going to actually break this down into two, two numbers. Okay. Um, okay, so let, let's think about it. Uh, 0.1 times 1.007. That's just... Uh, 0.1007. And this is going to work out in volts. So I'm just going to put volts right there. Can anyone multiply these two numbers together for me just as an intermediate calculation? 0.13, or sorry, 1.3 times minus 0.931. That'd be a negative 1.2103. Alright, so th there's a reason I'm doing this, everybody. Uh, we're going to use these two numbers later, but okay. Now let now let's actually compute the difference. What's the difference between this and that? Also, keeping in mind we're keeping our sig figs at three. We got a negative one point ten. Yeah. Point one zero nine. Um. Yeah. So. When we round it and take the absolute value, it's uh, 1.11, okay? So at that particular moment in time, we're inducing just over a volt in the uh, loop. But remember, it's, if you plug in different times, you'll get different results out. Um, okay, and of course, um, let's just shortcut this. If epsilon <coughs> equals I times R, so if the induced EMF is the current we induce times the resistance. And in this case, what was our resistance? Just one ohm? What does that mean about our current? Yeah, it's just, just 1.11 divided by R, which is just one. So it's 1.11 amps. Okay? Okay, so what we found is, what is the magnitude of the induced current? Um, what we haven't figured out is which way is the current flowing. That's actually kind of tricky in this case, okay? Because we have these two competing effects. One of the effects is the B field is increasing, and the other effect is the area is decreasing, okay? And those tend to induce currents in different directions, essentially. Okay, um, but one of those obviously was a bigger effect and one out. So our job is to figure out, okay, which one of those two effects is a bigger effect and sort of wins out. So let's go back to the picture, okay? And, and um, what do we have in this picture? We have a B field coming out of the page, okay? Um, let's just think about that first, right? Um, I have a B field coming out of the page, and the strength of that B field is increasing. Okay, what kind of current would that tend to induce? Let's just forget the fact that the area is changing. Just think about the, the fact that the B field is changing. Okay? So, if I have a B field coming out of the page, that would tend to increase the magnetic flux if the B field strength is going up, right? If I turn up the strength of the B field, I increase the flux coming out at us, correct? Okay. What kind of B field should be induced if my flux is increasing? It should be in the opposite direction, right? Going into the page. Because I, I want to oppose that change. What direction should current flow to induce a B field going into the page? Yeah. So... 
The fact that the B field is increasing, okay, this term right here, the change in the B field term, what this is describing is something that tends to induce clockwise current. Okay? So if we just look at that effect alone, it, it would tend to induce a clockwise current. Okay, now let's separately think about the effect of the changing area. Okay, so with my area, that's actually decreasing because I'm sliding the bar this way, decreasing the overall area of the loop. Okay, so basically that tends to decrease the magnetic flux, doesn't it? So that would tend to induce what kind of B field? So if I decrease the area, that tends to induce a B field going the same way as the one we already have. That's a B field coming out of the pitch. What direction is the current to create a B field coming out of the pitch? Yeah. So the effect of the area changing, which is this second term, because that's dA dt, is to tends is to tend to induce a, a current which is counterclockwise. Okay? So that's what we have here, okay? The first term is associated with the clockwise current, the second term associated with the counterclockwise term. Now, now which one is bigger? The second term, right? The second term this is the bigger term, um, and that's the one that's associated with the counterclockwise current. So the overall effect would be a counterclockwise current, which is 1.11 amps, okay? So if you ever have multiple changing variables, you're going to have to do a product rule once you apply uh, Faraday's law. And that means you'll have two different terms, and they could potentially be giving you different results as far as which way the current's going to go. So how do you figure it out? You just look at the two terms, and you determine which one is larger. That tells you which way the current is going to go. Okay? All right. So that was kind of the last tricky example. The, less, the, the rest of the lecture, what I want to do is talk about applications. Okay? There are a lot of technological applications of Faraday's law. Some of them we've already touched on. And I'm also going to show you a cool demo, um, which may uh, surprise you a little bit. Okay. So, technological applications. Here we go. The first one we're going to go over, we already talked about, but it's really important, so I'm going to say it again. AC generators. Okay. When you have a coil of wire which is rotating inside of the B field. You can imagine, for example, putting that coil in between the two uh, poles of like a horseshoe magnet like this, such that it's inside a very strong B field. When you start rotating that, you're creating a change in flux through the coil. And so we know by now that according to Faraday's law, that's gonna produce a changing EMF in the coil. And we can use that, we can hook that coil up to different devices to provide alternating current to power those devices, okay? And again, this is how electricity is generated on the large scale, not only in this country, but most of the world, okay? Again, the big exception being solar. Um, so, if we kind of take a look at the design of this, it should look familiar. We talked in previous chapters about how electrical motors work. Remember that? How does a motor work? We have some kind of power source, which runs current through a coil. That coil is in a magnetic field, and the torque that it feels from the magnetic field uh, makes it start rotating. So it looks like it's almost the same thing as a generator. Basically, it's just run in reverse. So what's going on with the generator? We start with some rotational motion. You have to do some kind of mechanical work to rotate the coil. And then what comes out of that is the electrical power. For a motor, it's just the opposite. 
Okay, you have to input some electrical power to run some current through the coil, and then as a result of that, you get the rotational motion. But the design is pretty similar, right? You can actually see this. Um, we're gonna do a lab next week where you build your own AC generator, really you know, simple tabletop AC generator, and you're gonna run it as a motor. You can see that you can just hook it up to a power source and it functions perfectly well as a motor, okay? So here's kind of an animation of that. It's shown you similar things before. Again, there's our rotating coil and there is the AC voltage it's outputting, okay? So that's how they work. Next thing to talk about is something called the back EMF of a motor. So just by a show of hands, who's an electrical engineer, aspiring electrical engineer out there? All right, so I'm sure you'll work on motors at some point uh, in your education or not on the job. Um, one important effect uh, to keep in mind is something called the back EMF. So let's, let's explain that. So remember, when you have a motor, you've got a coil, it's got some current running through it, and that coil is uh, rotating inside of a magnetic field, okay? Well, basically, when a coil rotates inside of a magnetic field, you're going to create an EMF, right? You're going to create an EMF because of Faraday's law, right? Because the flux going through that coil is changing. So in other words, you're trying to run a motor, but it's also acting like a generator. You can't really prevent that. You're generating an EMF across it. And that really is unavoidable, okay? And it turns out this EMF that's generated because of Faraday's law, basically, it acts against the source voltage. So in other words, let's say I use a battery to power my motor, right? That would be what I'm calling my source voltage. I'll call it E source, epsilon source, okay? But once the, again, once the uh, motor starts spinning, I'm generating this back EMF, and that goes against the source voltage. So it kind of, it's as if we have another battery facing the wrong way, right, like this. Okay, so it's kind of preventing the, the motor from spinning as fast as we might want it to be, okay? Because if we think about the way Faraday's law works, when you have a spinning coil, the faster that coil spins, the greater the, the EMF you induce, right? So the circuit kind of looks like this. We have our source voltage, we have our back EMF, and then the motor itself has some resistance in its coil. This is like the simplest kind of circuit diagram of a motor, right? This is your source voltage, your back EMF, and the resistance of your coil, okay? So basically, because this guy gets bigger, the back EMF gets bigger, the faster it spins, we're gonna be drawing less and less current to the motor the faster it spins. So it kind of self-regulates in that way. So let's real quick do um, a circuit diagram and uh, a loop rule to really just figure out you know, how the current going to the motor can be found. So again, this is our model. We have some kind of source voltage that could be the battery that's powering the motor or whatever. You have the back EMF which is opposing this voltage. And then you have whatever the total resistance of the coil is for your motor. So we have current flowing like this across the circuit. Let's just do a loop rule real quick. Remember how this works? So the sum of voltages in a complete loop of your circuit uh, go to zero. So maybe we'll start by going across this battery. Positive or negative if I go this way across it? Positive. Yeah, so we have positive epsilon s and then negative epsilon v. So again, it effectively saps away some of your applied voltage because it opposes it. And then what? Minus ir equals zero. So let's actually solve for i. We have I times the resistance of the coil equals epsilon S minus epsilon V. Let's solve for I. This will tell us how much current 
is being drawn into the motor. So it's the difference of your source and your back EMF divided by the resistance of your coil. Okay. And let's think about like two cases. The motor is just starting up, so it's like barely moving at all. You're just starting to turn it on and get it moving. And then let's think about it's been rotating for a while and it's kind of just going at a steady speed. Okay, so it's already started up. Well, see, my back EMF is going to be really small when the motor just starts up because it's going to be rotating so slowly, right? So you're going to be generating that back EMF very slowly. So at first, um, you, you generate or you draw a lot of current. There's a big value of I for the current going into the coil. But as time goes on, the back EMF gets bigger and bigger because our motor is rotating faster and faster. So we're subtracting a bigger number up here, and that means we're drawing less and less current. So your motor draws the most current right when you start it up, and it draws the least current once it's going at a steady rate. Have you ever noticed that happen before? Is that why the car, um, like the car is the RPM and stuff always like goes right to the top when it can start it and then it goes down again? Well, that's a little different because that's, uh, that's not an electrical motor. I didn't think uh, that yeah, that, that's, that's something else. But have you ever noticed this effect? Have you ever been in the kitchen and you turn on the garbage disposal and then you see the lights flicker? Yeah. You've all seen that? <laughs> that's why. Okay? Because you draw the most current to the motor of the garbage disposal right when you turn it on. And that means other things like the lights in your kitchen are receiving less current momentarily. They go dim, but then as soon as it's spinning at a pretty steady rate, they, they flicker back. Okay, over here. Is this, is this sort of why, like, if you're in, like, if you're in like, your car and like, let's say you turn it off every time you get to a stoplight and then turn it back on the light turns green, it's going to be way less efficient than if you just keep it still like, running? Uh, so again, th this strictly is uh, an effect of an electrical motor. Uh, so yeah, like, like the starter or the, the electric, like you use the battery to start the car. I, that's, that's I'm not, I'm not, so I'm not sure, but I, I doubt that some inefficiency in the starter motor is, okay. is the, the main effect there. Yeah. I was say, that does make sense though with regards to EPA ratings on electric vehicles when they're in constant motion versus mm -hmm. like city yeah. traffic, city traffic uh, ratings are kind of garbage. But their highway is actually decent. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's assuming true. no stop go traffic. Yeah. So anyway, I'm a, these are all good points. I want to just uh, summarize here. When starting up, a motor draws the most current, and uh, you've probably seen that happen before. All right. Here's another um, application of Faraday's law: microphones to capture sound, to record sound, um, and this looks very similar in a lot of ways to how speakers work. I showed you that before. Um, so there's kind of a similarity between motors and generators in the same way there's a similarity between speakers and microphones. So how does a microphone work in the first place? Every microphone has a small membrane called a diaphragm uh, attached to it. And basically when a sound wave comes in, it hits that diaphragm and it exerts a force on it. Now a sound wave is just air which is oscillating back and forth at some frequency. So when the sound wave hits the diaphragm of your microphone, it's just forcing it to oscillate back and forth at that same exact frequency. So basically the, the information in your sound wave is like encoded in how this uh, diaphragm is oscillating. So if we can just convert that motion into an electrical signal, then we can effectively record the sound, okay? So that's where Faraday's law comes in. If we take this diaphragm and we attach it to a coil, and that coil itself is wrapped around a magnet, then we can start to generate some current in that coil. Because if you think about it, if the coil stays still, there's a magnetic flux through it because of this magnet being there, uh, and that flux is a change. But if the coil is moving now, now there will be a changing magnetic flux as the coil moves back and forth, right? If it's like dead center on the magnet, you have the most flux, it kind of moves away from the magnet, 
you have a little less flux, and so it's changing over time as the coil vibrates, right? So as we know, that's going to generate an EMF in that coil, which is going to cause current to start flowing in that coil. And if you take that electrical signal and you send it somewhere, maybe send it somewhere to be recorded, maybe send it somewhere to be amplified through another speaker or something like that, um, that's how we can make use of a microphone. Okay? So it's basically the same thing as a, a speaker just run in reverse. With a speaker, we start with an input electrical signal going through the wires, which forces the coil to vibrate and send out a sound wave. This is just the same thing in reverse. Sound wave comes in, uh, moves the diaphragm back and forth, and creates some current in this coil. And the current contains all the information about the sound, all the audio information about that sound that hit it. Yeah? Would microphones have some level of experience with that EMF then? Um, so, I mean, we don't call it a back EMF, yeah. it's, just, it's just the EM, yeah, there's an EMF here that uh, is driving, you know, current in the first place, yeah. But yeah, it's, you know, Faraday's law is at play for sure, yeah. So here's an animation of that, okay? Um, by the way, I mean, this is a really simple design for a microphone, you can do it in a lot more sophisticated ways than this, but the basic physical principle is still going to hold, okay? So when something's like, I don't know if you ever recorded something like that was loud, basically it's going too fast to uh, give out like a signal or something, or why is that? And it um, cuts out? I'm sorry, when it cuts out? When a mic cuts yeah, out? Yeah, like when your microphone cuts out, or I don't know if you ever recorded something and something loud goes off. Like feedback, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so with microphone feedback, um, like, if you have a microphone here and then, like, a speaker that's playing the same sound back, it's just being hit with a sound wave that exactly matches this vibration, so it's kind of, like, in resonance with it. It's going to make it vibrate more and more violently. And, uh, yeah, there's only... If, if the signal's too strong, it gets distorted, and it just doesn't sound good anymore. Um, has anyone heard of magnetic brakes before? These are found on, uh, you know, some trains uh, nowadays, but um, it's actually a more general phenomenon where if you have relative motion between a magnet and a conductor that's close by, an EMF is going to be induced, okay? So basically we know that from Faraday's law. If you have a conductor here and you move a magnet next to the conductor, what is that conductor going to see? It's going to see a changing magnetic field, correct? When you have a changing magnetic field, you induce an EMF. That induced EMF can create loops of currents in your conductor. So remember, we're not talking about just like a wire wrapped into a loop anymore. We're talking about like a continuous metal sheet. So within that piece of metal, within that conductor, you're going to have loops of current circulating around, just like you would if you had a little coil of wire there. Okay, and um, those are called eddy currents, by the way. So these, these little loops of currents, these little um, kind of circulating currents in the piece of metal are called eddy currents. All right, now let's take it one step further. If you have these eddy currents forming in the metal, they produce magnetic fields themselves, right? If you have current circulating like this, it produces a magnetic field. So now you have your original magnet, and then the magnetic field produced by these eddy currents. Turns out, those fields can repel each other to slow the motion down, okay? So let me show you one example in an animation, or in a video, and another one, uh, I'll do it live. So here, check this out. This is our magnet, this is our conducting piece of metal, and it just, instantly brings it to a stop. It breaks it. It doesn't even touch. Okay? Why is that? Because, again, you know, this moving magnet creates a changing magnetic flux through this piece of metal. That produces the eddy currents, which themselves produce a B-field, which repels this magnet. Okay? And that's how you get magnetic breaking. And it's the same effect if uh, it's like a metal disc rotating through the poles of a magnet like that. You can use that to slow 
rotation down in, let's say, a train, like in the, in the wheels of a train. Um, all right, so I'm going to show you an example. I have some strong neodymium magnets here. You can see how strong they are. They're kind of hard to separate, right? And I have a conductor, okay? So I'm going to drop this magnet through the conductor. What's going to happen? Let's do, it. Let's do a test case. Let's do a non-magnetic material, just so you know I'm not bullshitting you. Um, okay, let's yeah, do yeah. A, uh, a penny, okay? That, that's not very interesting, right? Any guesses what will happen when I do this? Very slow or not at all. That's a lot slower, right? Okay, so what's going on? That's just magnetic breaking, right? So as this magnet falls through the tube, it creates a, it creates a changing magnetic flux all along it. That induces current to start flowing in that tube. And that current itself is producing a magnetic field, which is repelling the magnet that's falling. Okay, and that's what causes it to fall more slowly compared to something that's a non-magnet like this red cap, okay? So I'll leave this here. You want to try it out after class? Give it a try. It's pretty cool. Okay. It's like a, a higher magnetic field, like a, a stronger magnet. Would it just float in there by any chance or no? Uh, it would just fall more slowly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It would fall slower and slower the, the stronger the magnet you use. So that would be like a physical Yeah, it's um, it, it it's similar in a lot of ways to, to air resistance, right? Yeah. Can you can you feel any sort of feedback in your hand, the one that's holding the tube? Yeah, yeah, because uh, the tube exerts a force on the magnet. The magnet exerts a force back, and you can feel that. Yeah. So it's it's like it feels a little heavier for a second while it's while it's falling. You should try it out. Um, Okay, a couple more pieces of technology. Let's do transformers. Um, the, the kind that you see on uh, electrical poles, right? So um, what is a transformer? Transformer is something that transfers AC electrical energy from one circuit to another, and it does it in a way typically to increase the voltage or decrease the voltage. That's usually the, the purpose. So you see, elect, uh, you see transformers on electrical lines a lot, which are either stepping the voltage up so the power can be transmitted over a long distance, or stepping the voltage down so the power can go into your house and be at a safe voltage, okay? So um, here's basically the way it works. A transformer consists of an iron core. So this is just a giant chunk of iron in the shape of a donut, more or less, and you have on one side what we call the primary coil, where it's just a bunch of turns of wire wrapped around that side, and then you have a secondary coil where, again, you just wrap a wire many times around that side. So what you do is you hook up some device over here, um, or set of devices over here, and that's your input power. This is what you're putting into the transformer. And then you hook up something over here, and that's your output, okay? And what we see is there's some kind of voltage on the primary side and some voltage across on the secondary side. And basically, just by messing with how many turns of wire you have, just by messing with the end value, how many times you wrap the wire around on each side, you can control the ratio of the input to the output voltage. So you can... Again, you step it up, make it bigger than before, or step it down, depending on what you want to do. So, this actually does rely on Faraday's law, if you think about it. Because let's say I run some AC power, some AC voltage across on the primary side. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be creating an alternating current in this coil. And that alternating current is going to create a magnetic field that goes all the way through this iron core and then goes through the secondary coil, okay? So basically, if that magnetic field is changing, it's gonna be changing if you have AC power because the current's gonna be sloshing back and forth, the magnetic field's gonna be sloshing back and forth. 
Then you're going to induce some current in the secondary coil because you have a changing magnetic field going through it. Okay? So, okay, not quite enough time. I'll just tell you the result. Faraday's law says this. If you, if you apply Faraday's law on both sides, and you say the flux of field lines on each side is basically the same, you can show that this is true. Vs divided by Vp, that's the ratio of the secondary to the primary voltage, is Ns divided by Np. So that allows you to do one of two things. You can have what's called a step-up transformer, where there's more windings on the secondary side compared to the primary side. If you have Ns bigger than Np, then you're going to have more voltage on the secondary side than on the primary side. So that's what we mean by stepping up the voltage. And if it's the other way, where there's more windings on this side, then you have what's called a step-down transformer, where the, the voltage you get out is less, okay? So again, there are different points in our electrical grid where you might want to step the voltage up or down for various reasons. Anyone know why we might do that? For purposes of traveling distances, like you might want to make it go longer distance or something. Yeah, so, Exactly. If we take a kind of bigger picture look at the electrical grid, um, a lot of the different components in our electrical grid rely on Faraday's law, from the generation of power through electrical generators to the transformers that step the voltage up and down. It's, it's Faraday's law a lot of the way uh, along that, that route. So um, here's a real simplified picture. We have some kind of power plant, generates AC power. What's going on in that power plant? Well, somehow you're rotating a giant turbine. You could do that through nuclear power, uh, burning fossil fuels, hydroelectric power, geothermal, many ways to do it. But if you can rotate a giant turbine, you can rotate the coil of a generator and create some alternating current. That's got to be distributed to everywhere on the grid. So typically, the power plant is somewhere far away from big population areas. So we have to send it over a long distance. We're going to use something called the step-up transformer. That is, we're going to increase the voltage so we can transmit the power over a long distance, over a high voltage line. You, you've probably seen these high voltage lines are the tallest ones around, and they're kind of the furthest away from where people live. Those high voltage lines are carrying the power from plants to, yeah, what's up? And don't those high voltage power lines only also emit some like a small level of radiation too? They don't, depends what you mean by radiation. Well, right? I mean, the, like, cause if I heard that like apparently for people who like live very close to them, like the, if they, they have to use cancer or something. Speaking. I don't know. No. Um, yeah, I think that's that's something. Um, so, all right. So once you have your power transmitted to like a real population center, now you want to step it down. So the voltage is at a more safe level to be transmitted on the smaller lines you see on streets, and then even step down again to, before it goes into your house. Okay. So over the long distance lines, it could be transmitted over like many kilovolts. But by the time it enters your home, it's just a couple hundred volts, right? So we need to step it down uh, along that process to get the power into your house at a safe voltage, okay? So everything from the generators to those transformers that step the voltage up and down relies on Faraday's law. So it's kind of important. Anyway, that's all the time we have. Some practice problems if you want to see them. Uh, but we have the test on Monday, so study for that.